It is way under, <laughs> like not reachable from any angle. We're gonna need a stick. <laughs> Sorry. Good morning and welcome to the Washington Ethical Society. I am Karen Schofield Leka. My pronouns are per and per, short for person, and I am your officiant this morning. Our opening words this morning are from Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermon at Temple Israel of Hollywood in June 1965. When our days become dreary with low hovering clouds of despair, and when our nights become darker than a thousand midnights, let us remember that there is a creative force in this universe working to pull down the gigantic mountains of evil a power that is able to make a way out of no way and transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. Let us realize the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. As we explore our theme of making worth in the middle, may we bear in mind the span of the long arc and that bending can lead us toward good. Welcome to everyone for our multimedia platform, whether you're here in the hall, watching in real time on Zoom, or catching the recording later. We are one community unified across time and space, gathering to affirm our values and commit to a better world. If you're on Zoom, please check the chat for a welcome and various tips from Trang Duong, today's Zoom chat usher. And if you're here in the hall and would like an assisted listening device, please ask the sound team at the back. Visitors, if you're here in person, please stop by the welcome table after platform today to speak to a greeter or to our membership coordinator, Maceo Thomas. And for those of you visiting online, either now or later, you, we invite you to send an email to Maceo, which is M-A-C-E-O-T at ethicalsociety.org, that'll be in the chat, or fill out a connection form, which you can find at tiny.cc slash westconnects. I'll now read a few of the greetings that folks have written in the Zoom chat. And those of you who are joining virtually, you might want to go ahead and get a candle to light during our candle lighting segment. So let's see, what do we have in the chat? Uh, let me roll back. Let's see. Mark Mayer says, hello and buenos dias to everyone. Evie Van Noy, excuse me. E I can't see this very well. It's too small. Hello, happy Sunday, everyone. Uh, Selena Larson says, good morning, everyone. Barbara Nathanson says, good morning. Alex Abbott says, good morning. And Sheridan Wood says, good morning from Texas. So that is pretty awesome. And uh, we are, it is indeed good to gather and to share this time together. And the West Chorus and Band will now share our opening music.
Well, welcome once again. Each week we read our statement of purpose as a reminder of our shared values. And if you're interested in taking a turn to read the statement of purpose, you can sign up at tiny.cc slash read SOP. Today's reader is Ross Wells. Ross is a longtime member and a very active social justice warrior, uh, leading and co-leading a number of our activities. And you are gonna hear a bit in the announcements about two particular actions that he is encouraging all of us to take. Good morning. The Washington Ethical Society is a humanistic congregation that affirms the worth of every person. We strive through our relationships to elicit the best in the human spirit. With faith in human goodness, we appreciate each person's unique capacities. We joyfully celebrate together and support each other through life. We nurture a sense of reverence and responsibility for each other and the earth. Thanks so much, Ross. And we encourage all to join in our community. As Ross lights our community candle, I invite those of you with candles at home to light yours and for everyone to join in our candle lighting words. May we kindle within us the warmth of compassion, the light of understanding, and the fire of commitment to build a brighter future for all. Our senior leader, Casey Slack, will now present today's story for all ages. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Our story this morning is Ordinary People Change the World. I am Martin Luther King, Jr. This one's a little bit long, so I might not finish it but it'll be available in our library all week and in the weeks to come. So if you wanna come and read the rest of this story, you are welcome, you are encouraged. And I am here on Tuesdays and Thursdays if you wanna chat with me about it. I am Martin Luther King Jr. You should have some pictures on the slide, so I'm not gonna turn this book around. 
When I was little, I used to get into a lot of accidents. One day, my little brother hit me in the head with a baseball bat. Two other times, I mistakenly got knocked over by a car. Another day, I tumbled over our banister and then bounced through an open door into the basement. Even before I could read, I knew I liked books. My dad always talked about how I kept a lot of books around me. I used to tell my parents, when I grow up, I'm going to get me some big words. There is a power in words. Big words were in my future. When I was six years old, one of my best friends was a boy whose father owned a store across the street. My friend was white, I was black. It didn't matter to us. We would play games and have fun together. But when we started going to school, everything changed. He went to a school where all the kids were white. I went to a school where everyone was black. Soon after, he told me, I can't play with you anymore. Why? My dad said so. He said he doesn't want us being friends. But why? You're one of my best friends, aren't you? Aren't you? I didn't understand. It didn't make sense. At dinner, my parents explained, it's because you're black and he's white. I was so mad that day. How could someone treat me differently just because of the color of my skin? I wanted to hate my friend and his father. But my parents told me to do the opposite, that I should love my friend even though he hurt me. They taught me that it's better to have more love in your life than hate. Then my mother taught me one of the most important lessons of all. You are as good as anyone. You must never feel that you are less than anyone else. I wanted to believe it, but every day I saw the opposite. I saw you could be treated unfairly just because of the color of your skin. If you were white, you went to a good school with great playgrounds and plenty of books. If you were black, your school was small, sometimes with no desks or even windows. And it wasn't just the schools. Black people had to use different water fountains, different elevators, even different bathrooms. In fact, on a hot day when everyone wanted ice cream, if you were white, you could sit at the counter and eat from a nice dish. But since I was black, they served me, if at all, through a side window, and they put my ice cream in a flimsy paper cup. It got even worse when I was 14. I had just won a speech competition. My speech was about being fair to all people. I was so excited. Then, on the bus, a few white people got on board. You need to give up your seat to the whites. At first, I stayed put. It didn't seem fair. But my teacher convinced me to move. We spent the rest of the ride standing and getting tossed in every direction. It was the angriest I have ever been. Every day, this is what life was like. Black people were treated terribly. The only question was, what could I do about it? At the age of 15, I started college. By 19, I became a minister and entered seminary school to study religion. Over those years, I read the works of Henry David Thoreau and Mahatma Gandhi. Thoreau taught me about civil disobedience, how an evil system could be changed without violence. Gandhi opened my mind to the power of love, using peaceful methods to change unfair things in society. It was a lesson I wanted to share with everyone. In no time at all, I got my chance. In Alabama, a black woman named Rosa Parks was told to give up her bus seat to a white man. It was just like what had happened to me. But unlike me, Mrs. Parks refused. She was arrested. 
Early the next morning, I got a phone call from a local community leader. It's time to take a stand. We should boycott the buses so everyone knows that we won't accept this treatment anymore. You know, that's not going to be easy. Do not ask if it is easy. Ask if it is right. It was just like Thoreau taught. Instead of using violence to protest the unfair rules, black people would use a peaceful message. We would not ride the public buses. Without our monies, the bus company would go out of business. Now the only question was, would it work? On the first day of the protest, my wife called me to the window. The buses are all empty. It's working. We had to keep it going. As the head of the bus boycott, I gave one of the most important speeches of my life. The room was packed. Camera crews were filming. I had only 20 minutes to prepare. I didn't use notes. But by speaking from my heart, I found out how big words can be. We are determined here in Montgomery to work and fight until justice runs down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. When the history books are written in the future, someone will have to say there lived a race of people, a black people, who had the moral courage to stand up for their rights. I'm going to stop here so that we have time for the rest of what we're doing today. But please do come look at this book, especially you young people. It's a good resource for you. And I look forward to chatting with you about it. Thank you. Each week, we ring this chime in solidarity with people around the world. Today, I am particularly mindful of the work of bending that moral arc that remains before us. And the example that Dr. King has given for using love to create justice. As we listen to the chime, let us remember our connection to each other and the world around us. Let us open our hearts to compassion for those who suffer. and let us commit ourselves to the work that calls for our love. Our theme of the month, Finding Our Center, encourages us to pause, reflect, and turn inward for some discovery. So I invite you to do just that in this time of meditation. Let's begin by settling our bodies. That may mean stretching first, mindful of the people who are beside you, <laughs> to release any tension, and then finding a position where your body feels at ease, or as close as it will allow. Take some deep, nourishing breaths. Inhale refreshment, and exhale stress. Close your eyes or soften your gaze. 
Let your mind become not silent, but quieter so that it can flow more smoothly rather than darting around. And breathe. What happens inside you in these silent moments? What do you hear? What do you feel? Can you hear your inner voice speaking more clearly when it's not overwhelmed by external noise? How do you know when you are hearing that unique voice? It is tender and truthful. It is not afraid of anything or anyone. What does that voice speak to you? We continue our meditation in silence and the music that follows. Today's reading is The Path of Finding Our Center from Soul Matters, January 2023. When we talk of finding our center, it's natural for calm and rest to be the first things that come to mind. Who would expect anything different? After all, the need for calm is everywhere we look. So, so many of us are tired. 
were overworked, over busy, over committed, overly scared. We are often so weighed down by responsibility and worry that it only takes one drop of something unexpected to tip us over. So yes, we long for rest. Yes, we want the swirl to stop. And yet, helping us find peace and calm is not the only work found on this path to finding our center. As our faith reminds us, being a centered person often involves the opposite of keeping things calm. In order to, war to move toward a balance of justice, we have to upset the current state of things. Oppressive systems need to be challenged and toppled. And to accomplish that, we need to sacrifice calm and comfort, including our own. We need to remember that achieving a balance of equality requires us to be purposefully off balance and out of step with our culture. Or as Martin Luther King Jr. said, we need to be people who are maladjusted to the way things are. And I'm stepping out of the reading for a moment here to add that for those of us who hold dominant identities and the privileges that come with it, we also need to decenter ourselves to make space and draw to the center those who are typically on the margins. Now back to the reading. All add all of this up and suddenly our center appears to be a much richer place than is often recognized. It's not simply a place of peace and calm. It's also a place of being pushed and launched. What you hear in this deep space within is not just the whisper of rest and breathe, but also take a deep breath and jump. We encounter an invitation there, not just relaxation. It's a still point, yes but a still point upon which we pivot and turn to something new. So as we try to make sense of finding our center, it's fine to pull up the image of the Buddha sitting peacefully under a tree, but we can't let that overshadow the image of a diver balancing way up there on her diving board, pausing to regain her composure and courage so she can leap and go all in. Maybe in the end, instead of only asking each other, are you centered these days? We need to ask, where is your center sending you these days? And where is your center calling you to go? This Sunday, we will hear from senior leader Casey Slack for our platform address. Thank you, Karen. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr gave his last speech in support of striking sanitation workers at the Mason Temple in Memphis, Tennessee on April 3rd, 1968, the day before he was assassinated. The title of this work was, I've Been to the Mountaintop. He begins, I am delighted to see you here tonight in spite of a storm. You reveal that you are determined to go on anyhow. Something is happening in Memphis. Something is happening in our world. He talks about how of all the times in history he would choose to live right when he did because something is happening in our world. He says, the masses of people are rising up and wherever they are assembled today, whether they are in Johannesburg, South Africa, 
Nairobi, Kenya, Accra, Ghana, New York City, Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, or Memphis, Tennessee, the cry is always the same. We want to be free. We find ourselves perhaps in a similar moment in the world. One of those way ways that history doesn't repeat, but rhymes where throughout the world, people are crying out for their desire to be free. Where workers at your local Starbucks and the Amazon warehouse alike have gathered to unionize, to say the way that you have been treating us, the way you have been extracting our labor and turning it into wealth for yourself, Jeff Bezos is wrong. Saying that your piles of money, your mountains, your hoard will not save you, will not save us, will not save the world, but that we will. That we need not look to the halls of power, I'm not gonna gesture down the street, to the halls of power to tell us that we can care for each other. That we, in fact, have the power when we join together to say, this is right. This is what it means to live together on this planet, to love together on this planet. Dr. King goes on in his speech to talk about the protests that have been occurring, his plans to return for another march, and his deep belief in nonviolent protest. He lovingly chastises the clergy of his faith who focused so intently on the next world that they fail to care for the people in front of them. He thanks the gathered clergy for their choice to be involved. He discusses the dangers and the necessities of becoming involved in care for those who suffer. And he urges us through the years to develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness. Let's rest with that for a moment. Dangerous unselfishness, the kind of commitment to one another that can change the world. The kind of saying, okay, this isn't for me, it's for you. Your needs matter to me as my own do, if not more. The kind of unselfishness that leads you to perhaps on a dangerous road from Jerusalem, stop and feed someone who is hungry. On a dangerous road, perhaps in El Salvador and perhaps right here in DC to say, I am here for you. I care for you because you and I are bound together networked in an ongoing time and space crossing web of all creation. As Dr. King approaches the end of his speech, he tells about being stabbed in 1960. How they said that if he had so much as sneezed in that time, he would have died and how he received a letter from a young white woman expressing her joy that he did not sneeze. How this letter spoke to him of something that was possible and changing in the world. That someone would reach out to him though she did not need to. That a young white person would express this kind of care for the life 
of a black man. He ends his speech with a powerful and important paragraph, one that seems prescient given what would happen the very next day. One that we might find on the surface to be difficult to absorb, irrelevant, or maybe even uncomfortable for us as humanists, ethical culturists, and so on. But which I believe points us to something very important. Reverend Dr. King says, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. It's really easy to read this as, I know I'm going to heaven, so it doesn't matter what happens to me. But that isn't what he says. It's easy to get caught up in God's will and capitalized he and the promised land and the coming of the Lord and decide that whatever is being said here is irrelevant to us, fixated on other worldliness with which we are not concerned. But if you think back to his criticism of his colleagues, his clergy mates, Baptists in particular, and their concern for the other world, if you think about what it means to see the promised land, you might find a different kind of advice. Dr. King often talked about something he called beloved community the place that we're going, where all are seen for their inherent worth and dignity, valued for their own special skills and cared for according to their needs. The mountaintop, the promised land, the thing that he had seen was a place for his people to live a future, a way of being that accepts us all, where we can live in the light of our own inherent value. You might reflect to yourself on where you have seen this potential, where you have seen our shared ethical culture values in action human worth and uniqueness valued appropriately. Individuals and communities eliciting the best in one another. Respect, care, and reverence for interconnectedness between and amongst one another. Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman, who was one of Dr. King's favorite theologians and who apocryphally I have heard saved Dr. King's life that time he got stabbed in a sort of roundabout way because Dr. King had a copy of one of Dr. Thurman's books in his pocket right where 
someone tried to stab him. Howard Thurman wrote, keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve, that in fair weather or in foul, in good times or in tempests, in the days when darkness and the foe are nameless or familiar, I may not forget that to which my life is committed. Keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve. Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was a Unitarian minister before he was the transcendentalist author most are familiar with, wrote, a person will worship something. Have no doubt about that. We may think our tribute is paid in secret in the dark recesses of our hearts, but it will come out. That which dominates our imaginations and our thoughts will determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship. For what we are worshiping, we are becoming. Now, we don't talk about worship a lot around here, and that is fine. We can think of that metaphor, that word as a metaphor, for what we focus on, right? That's what Thoreau is getting at. What do we focus on? Where do we return our imaginations again and again and again? We need to be careful about what we focus on, what we think of most often, how we choose our priorities. I had a teacher once a supervisor in my clinical pastoral education residency, a man who was a committed Buddhist. His name was Brian. And Brian told me one day that the first time he had moved to the Santa Monica neighborhood of Los Angeles, committed though he was and working in his faith though he was, he got caught up and he bought a sports car. <laughs> This pithy little story shows us that even people who are day after day working in their faith, working on their detachment, can lose track and become obsessed with material things to their eventual detriment. I think we're all familiar with this. You set out to do something and then you get fixated on something else. You become more interested in being right than being together, more concerned for your ego and your status than for the good of all, so caught up in the busyness, the hectic day-to-day -day churn of your life that doing the right thing falls by the wayside. You come to think that being centered means being calm. And so you avoid conflicts that are necessary. You fail to speak when your voice is needed. We all do it, me too. Keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve. Remind me, self, universe, life, of who it is that I, in my deepest core, wish to be. Remind me when I can't remember that people are good, that the basic state of humanity is creative and loving and connecting, that all else is unimportant, ultimately. If you'll give me a moment to get in my little preacher bag, I, too, have been to the mountaintop. I have seen the promised land, sometimes only in flashes. 
in little queer communities that build each other up, in families that come together against all odds, in people who choose, despite severe social pressure, to still care for one another enough to put on a mask. I've seen the promised land in the way a community comes together when one of their own is hurting, in the way my biological family shows up no matter what, despite everything that has been offering fruit and vegetables to my parents when my wife's mother died. Strange responses, but still from the right place. I have seen people open their pocketbooks wider than mine even goes for communities that have given them life and love. I have seen people risk jail, risk imprisonment, risk shunning from society because other people are in danger. They've seen the promised land. They've been to the mountaintop and though I may only go there rarely, though in our lives together we may only visit, we have to remember it. When we are finding our centers, we must put in it. We must wrap around it who we know we can be. We must remind each other as often as we can that there is something other than power and money there is something other than status and being right. There is connection, there is love, there is beauty, and there is change. There is us learning how to dive off that high beam together, trusting that we can splash into the water and come back up and do it again if we didn't get it quite right that first time. Knowing that we sit and stand on the shoulders of giants, some who are present in this room, and that we work together every single day for that promise of something better than what we were born into. That place that we can go if only we choose. Thank you so much, Casey. In a few minutes, we will have our community sharing time when you can write into the chat or share here from the microphone about what resonated for you in this platform. And so while we're listening in a moment to today's musical response, you might prepare by reflecting on a personal experience or an activity here at WES that this platform brings to mind. And I'll encourage folks to be mindful of both the center and the margins. And if you are often in the center, perhaps leave space there for others. And if you tend to hang on the margins, I encourage you to step in and step up and speak. To prepare for the musical piece, I share these words from Martin Luther King Jr.'s February 4th 1968 sermon, The Drum Major Instinct. He said, we all have the drum major instinct. We all want to be important, to surpass others, to achieve distinction, to lead the people and the parade. And the great issue of life is to harness the drum major instinct. It is a good instinct if you don't distort it and pervert it. 
Don't give it up. Keep feeling the need for being important. Keep feeling the need for being first. But I want you to be the first in love. I want you to be the first in moral excellence. I want you to be the first in generosity. This is the time when we add our own voices to the morning, sharing our reflections on the platform or what resonates with our own personal experience. 
For our online participants, I invite you to share in the Zoom chat or in the comments if you are listening and watching the recording later. If you're here in person, you can come to the microphone here at the floor, but please keep your comments brief so that others may share. When you come forward, you can feel free to take off your mask, encourage you to say your name and your pronouns and your brief comments, and then please put your mask on before you return to your seat. I'm gonna start by reading some initial Zoom comments. Let's see. Public, oh, nope, so, so far no Zoom comments as yet. Uh, so we'll start then from the microphone. Hi, my name is Susan. Um, sorry if I start to cry again, but it's amazing how listening to that story brought back um, my freshman year in college at Tufts University and I had a wonderful roommate. And the next year she was going to Europe, so I needed a new roommate. And so I chose another young woman who was in her suite. I grew up in Chicago in Hyde Park, liberal as could be, went to the University of Chicago Laboratory School, so I had never personally experienced racism. But all of a sudden there was all this chatter around in the dorm and I couldn't figure out why I, well, what was happening. And it was that the person who was going to be my roommate was talked by her parents <laughs> that she could not room with me because I was black. And it still hurts. Hi, I'm Josh. <clears throat> When I was 13 years old, I was sitting in this very room about a week after Martin Luther King had been assassinated. And Ed Erickson, who was the, the leader at that time, gave a speech that um, came to be known as Big Moon. And uh, he started out by talking about how the morning he had gone down to the local diner where he went to in, in Washington and how uh, the predominantly white patrons were crowing about what had happened, saying it was wonderful that, it, it, that this was done, and him walking in rage and talking about that rage. But he concluded by saying that he wanted, this is, remember this is April of 1968, and the moon landing was 14 months later that what he wanted was for that astronaut, whether it was Russian or whether it was American, whoever it was, to get off of that lunar module and step on that soil and say, and take a look and then see this beautiful big moon up in the sky from that moon and seeing all clustered with colors and realizing that down on there when it looks serene, that there were so many hurts and so many things that needed to be healed. At 13 years old, that gave me the shivers, and I got the same shivers this morning. Hi, I'm John, he, his. I want to do this justice. Um, let me give it a try. In the mid-60s, I'm guessing 66, 67, I was around four years old. And I, I, I vaguely remember my first friend. He lived across the street. And we loved playing in his yard. And I have some memories of what we would do. And my mother had a rule that I could play with him only in his yard. I could not go into his house. And it was awkward because I couldn't understand why, so it was hard for me to explain to my friend's mother why I couldn't come in when she would invite us to have lemonade. And then after happy months, they were relatively new in the neighborhood, I think, after many, a number of happy months, he had a teenage brother. And my mother told me that I couldn't be his friend anymore because his older brother had been arrested. 
The part that's hardest and the part that makes me want to center myself when I, in my own psychologically, not socially, but center myself, is because the journey to understanding that experience required me to think about the white boy in that reading. Because the white boy in that reading didn't fully grasp why he couldn't go in the house until he was almost 40 years old and attended an anti-racism training. Because you can't name why. You can't grow. So that was an opportunity for me to recognize, I think one of the things that made it so toxic is my mother never told me why I couldn't go in the house. So I had to tell myself and I had to other, have other people help me understand. And that's, I think, how I can do my own internal healing. Uh, hi, um, Jeff here again. You mentioned the word focus, Casey, and that I was thinking about focus and what does society focus on? What does history focus on? Um, history is very fickle. And there is yet another player. We've heard the names of, of Rosa Parks and certainly Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, there's another player who doesn't get mentioned very often. And I've never met anybody else who knew who this person was. So I will ask, does the name J.P. Blake ring a bell? Has anybody heard of him? He was the guy, he was the driver who tossed Rosa Parks off the bus. And yet, we have no record of him. Um, what, what happened to him after, I guess, the 1955 boycott? Did he continue on? How did he adapt to the new rules and regulations that uh, had turned his world upside down, as narrow and parochial as it might have been? What happened to him at his old age? Did he continue on to be a recalcitrant racist, or did he have that power to change? And sadly, we don't know. If anybody can find out what happened to J.P. Blake, I'd certainly be interested in finding out. Hi, Perry, he, him. I just want to add a little, uh, one more entry to our uh, synonym list in the thesaurus. So we've got mountaintop, um, beloved community, um, promised land, and ethical manifold. Well, it looks like our online participants have been stunned to silence today, <laughs> which means that they are deeply reflecting on what they have heard, no doubt. Um, and so thank you for those who have shared and for all who are um, reflecting on what is uh, deep work today. So thank you for that. And just as we share our thoughts and perspectives in this community, so too do we share our resources and gifts. Here at West, we split all undesignated contributions in the Sunday collection between our operating budget and a fund dedicated to justice and compassion. And this month, we are sharing half of the offering with No Lose, a diverse, vibrant community of fat, queer, and trans folks and their allies with a shared commitment to intersectional anti-oppression ideology and action, seeking to end the oppression of fat people. Its name reflects its origin as the national organizations of lesbians of size, but it has expanded its scope to include all genders. Its slogan is the revolution just got bigger. Indeed. 
So let's all take a moment to prepare to respond to the invitation to generosity. And for those who are able to respond, we offer several options. As you'll see on the screen, the number to give by text is 202-335-1885. And you can donate online via tiny.cc slash westgives or by clicking on give on our website, ethicalsociety.org. You can place cash or a check in the basket, which is at the back of the hall on your way out, and you can always send a check by mail. Thank you for your generosity. We will now receive your gifts and the gift of music from Art Stevens, who is performing a piece he wrote himself. I grew up uh, an upper middle class kid and drove trucks in the summertime and uh, when unemployed, largely to understand the blue collar world. This song, uh, Backing Up, discusses lessons learned about solving difficult problems in general. With tractor trailer driving, there's a lot to learn. Got to plan ahead to make those turns. Going forward ain't half as tough. There's no wind where you're going when you're backing up. Backing up ups the hardest part. Get a new start if you know it when you blow it your half away. Can admit your own home, there's hell to pay. When you back up, admit mistakes. If your angle's off, don't try to fake. Got to recognize a dead end. Denying doesn't work. If you fight, it just gets worse. Knowing how to back up is an art that can ease your mind and save your heart. It's not just when some old truck you won't make it if you can't back up backing up's the hardest part when you mess up get a new start if you know it when you blow with your halfway can't admit you're wrong there's hell to pay Thank you so much to the many people who helped create this morning's time together. Staff members and Dara Miles, Robin Kravitz, and Maceo Thomas, Inner Music Coordinator Leah Morris, the West Chorus and Band, and Ari Stevens, and our platform production team, which includes tech team members, slide artists, Zoom chat usher, in-person greeters, and virtual coffee hour host. You will see all these many names on the closing credits slide, and you too could be up on the slide if you would join those crews. At the conclusion of the platform, please join us for social hour in person, in the foyer and on the patio, or for virtual coffee hour via Zoom. First, though, I want to mention a few things upcoming in the life of our community. Wes is starting some new tie or together in exploration groups this month. These are small groups of Wes members and friends who meet once a month to dig deeper into our monthly themes. They're a great, great way to get to know others in the community and they're time limited, so it's not just an open-ended amorphous, no scary commitment. 
please do get in touch with membership coordinator Maceo Thomas to sign up or get more information. And I wanted to note two opportunities for us to put our ethics into action. First, the Share the Warmth campaign to collect clothing. This is new or lightly used clothing, but especially winter clothing like coats and sweatshirts, hats and gloves for immigrants and DC residents. Clean, bagged and labeled donations can be dropped off in the library here after platform, in the bins at the back of the Cedar Lane UU Church, or on the porch of Ross Wells and Beth Baker's home in Tacoma Park. Thank you in advance for your generosity supporting migrants and others in need. Our friends and partners in Camanas El Salvador are now targets of the Bukele regime. Last Wednesday, five water defender activists from Santa Marta were lined up like gang members filmed and taken by the police. They include our friend and partner Antonio Chico Pacheco, the director of ADES, our major partner in the El Salvador Water Project. Chico is someone we have met with every year for a dozen years. Walter, who along with his wife Dina has led history walks for several of our delegations. Our friend from El Verdeo, Vadalina Morales, a leader of the environmental anti-mining movement is out of the country and understandably afraid to return. This cannot go unchallenged. We must protest this horrible injustice. So please join other West members, other water defender supporters at the Salvadoran Embassy, which is a straight shot down 16th Street at 1400 16th Street Northwest here in DC today at 3.30 p.m. If you have questions about either of those two things, Ross Wells is actually here today and can fill in some details as needed. We also have a board video update from Donna Taylor, so I direct your attention to the screen. Good morning. I'm Donna Taylor, a member of your board of trustees. Good morning. I'm Donna Taylor, a member of your board of trustees, and I have the privilege of giving you the first board update of 2023. This morning, I have updates on four things. Our December Town Hall, Strategy Saturday, our financial picture and small group meetings with KC. The board held a town hall in early December for the membership. The purpose of this meeting is for members and the board to talk about topics and, and things that interest both and perhaps plant some seeds for future development. Over 40 members participated in this December town hall. We discussed a range of topics, including COVID protocols, West celebrations, conflict policies, a member initiated outreach activity, and building rentals, and common West jargon. We'll hold another town hall in the spring, so be on the lookout for information about that. On Saturday, January 28th, the board will host our annual Strategy Saturday. We've invited representatives of teams across West to collaborate with the board and the staff in developing focus goals for the... So what are focus goals? Well, they provide us a way to consciously focus our resources in priority areas. Using the focus goals, the staff will create work plans for the upcoming program year that starts July 1st. Focus goals will also guide our budgeting for the upcoming year. So speaking of budgeting, let's turn to finances. Like last year, Wes again faces the process prospect of a significant deficit for the fiscal year. It will deeply impact our reserve funds. For more details about this situation, I encourage you to read the email titled December Finance Team Update that was sent on December 15th. As we approach the spring pledge season, please do your best to give generously. In addition, we expect to see significant cuts 
in the proposed 2023-24 West budget and some difficult decisions for our community to make as we vote to approve an operating budget for the next fiscal year. On a happier note, our senior leader KC and their transition team continue to hold small group meetings with West members so we can all get to know each other better during KC's transition year. There have been three of these meetings so far and four more are scheduled throughout January and February. Please take a look at the January 6th email from Wes entitled Sunday in Person from Crowd to Community for more information and plans to join one of these sessions. Finally, on behalf of the board, I thank you for all you do for Wes. Thank you so much. Thank you to Donna and the whole board for your service to our community. That's it for today's announcements. As always, you can find information about opportunities to connect in the Sunday links or the news and notes emails that come out each week and on the calendar page of Wes's website. Thank you all for being part of Platform today, whether in person, via Zoom, or watching later. And I invite you to sing together our song of the month, Will You Come Home? So this is a short month for the song of the month. Um, we uh, didn't have a platform here on the first, and we had instrumental music on the eighth. And we'll be doing the all West all AEU platform on the 29th. So it's just two weeks. So for a short month, we have a short song. Leah arranged just the refrain from the song, Will You Come Home? And the refrain is very simple and it goes like this. Will you come home? Let's try that all together. One, two, and. Will you come home? Will you come home? Will you come home to your heart? Will you come home? Will you come home? Will you come home to your own heart? That's all it is. We are now going to do that three times. We will add some harmony parts. You guys just stay on that melody. One, two, and. Will you come home? A last few reminders before we leave. If you are new to our community, please send an email to our membership coordinator, Maceo Thomas, and introduce yourself. 
And for those who wish to socialize online, to reach the virtual coffee hour, point your browser to tiny.cc slash West Coffee Hour. And now I invite you to join me in our closing words for the month. Let us go into the week ahead with compassion, understanding, and commitment. Finding grounding in community, and our Again, thank you all for joining today's platform, and we look forward to joining and connecting with you again soon.